Hello, hi everyone, and welcome back. Oh, wow, I cannot even ex describe how excited I am for this next session and, um, and particularly um, the topics that we're going to cover. Um, most of you will know who Melissa Leong is, but I'm actually going to do an introduction just to tell you a little bit more about her illustrious career where she has spanned multiple different disciplines but enabled her to, um, to create a beautiful career doing lots of different things that she loves. Um, she has literally the best advice. Um, Mel, ask all the questions that you want because from my experience, Melissa answers them. She goes through them in perfect detail and gives plenty of examples. So please, guys, make sure that you put all of your questions in the Q&A box. Um, so let me give you a bit of an intro into Mel. So she is a freelance food and travel writer. She is a food media consultant, a radio broadcaster, a television presenter, an MC, a cookbook editor, and most of you will probably know her because she has been the co-host and judge on MasterChef Australia. I mean, get a load of that. Um, Melissa is actually a first-generation Singaporean, Australian, um, and basically she isn't afraid to consume anything at least once. Uh, she is a woman after my own heart. Uh, Melissa went to high school um, at the Inabora School, which is a media specialist school in the northern suburbs of Sydney. Now, Mel, if I haven't pronounced that correctly, please let me know. Uh, while she was there, she held a regional school music scholarship and was on track to attend the Conservatorium of Music, Conservatorium of Music, um, as a concert pianist. Like, what hasn't she done, honestly? Um, in the end, Mel decided to go to Sydney Uni and study economics, um, and she's ended up graduating with a double degree in economics and social sciences. Uh, so, Mel, without further ado, welcome to CareerCon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Oh, that's uh, that's quite the rap sheet. <laughs> it's actually, I was like scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. It still goes. It still goes. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, oh, I, I you're think so welcome. I, I think we're so blessed to have you here because you, as I mentioned before, you can actually. You know, you're, you're really forthright and forthcoming with your responses and it's just been so helpful even for me in my own career. So without further ado, um, I would love it if you could explain um, just a little bit about where you grew up and how that kind of, um, you know, made you fall into the career that you did and the choices that you did um, post high school. Sure. Okay. Well, I went to the Inabara School and it's actually in the Shire uh, in Sydney. And I'm very proud to say that I, I was born there and I was raised there as well. And um, I guess growing up in, uh, in the Shire, in the southern suburbs of Sydney uh, in the 80s and the early 90s, it was uh, a place where not a lot of people looked like me. So my parents came from Singapore in the 70s and we sort of had a, a reasonably close-knit community of sort of friends and family about the place. But in terms of going to school, um, you know, it was a, a reasonably uh, sort of homogenous place that didn't uh, involve people who looked like me. So it was an interesting way to grow up. I kind of just threw myself in, as, as all kids do, into doing what all the other kids do. And I did nippers and I did little athletics and I did piano and I did uh, Kumon mathematics and all of all of the different things that, um, you know, both I think as, as regular Australian kids do and then a lot of uh, a lot of uh, kids with a with an Asian background also do as well. So I always felt like I had a bit of a a split between um, what my friends did at school and the expectations of my parents. And I don't think that uh, those two things sort of met uh, harmoniously all of the time. But I think looking back that really gave me uh, the extra impetus to learn to be understood by everybody. And that's something that I've carried throughout my career and, um, and into what I do today. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I've grown up not in Sydney, obviously, but in Victoria and, you know, it's something similar. Like I remember even being in, um, being in high school and not seeing many different, different ethnicities, um, you know, until now I go back to the suburb and, you know, it's a complete multicultural playground and it's amazing. But um, yeah. so, you know, I know that you did go to university. Like can you sort of, you know, head into that next sort of stage and, and tell us what you studied and, and why you yeah. chose to study that? 
Yeah, so I guess just to recap the back end of high school, um, I was on track to go to the conservatorium. I Really, all I wanted to do when I was a kid was to be a concert pianist. And unfortunately, around sort of the age of 14 or 15, I developed um, RSI in my right posterior capsule. And um, that meant a chronic amount of pain that I still, you know, carry with me today when I'm on the laptop too much. And um, that can sort of trigger that that particular injury. So my my teachers basically said, look, if you go into the conservatorium, then you have to treat this like an elite athlete deals with a sporting injury and you will have to play through the pain literally and, and figuratively as well. So at that point I was a bit of a crossroad because I didn't really hadn't really thought about what else I might want to study. And so I chose an economics degree and initially it was just a straight economics degree uh, because I thought, well, you know, business and economics would be something that was flexible and broad enough to be able to give me the opportunity to feel out which particular area I might be interested in and I I would like to focus on. And I think by the end of the first the first year, I think I decided to augment that because I wasn't quite finding that the range of subjects available to me in a, in a singular degree uh, was sort of giving me the full university experience um, so to speak. So I wanted to study things like Asian studies and anthropology and political science. And and so to be able to augment my degree allowed me to be able to investigate some of those. And um, I feel like that's that gave me a much more well-rounded undergrad experience. And I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. So if you, um, this is just a bit of a side note question, but if you sort of had your time again and you could be a pianist, would you be? Oh, look, I don't believe in looking back. I think uh, life deals you whatever cards you're dealt and rather than regret or think what could have been, I like to just focus on moving forward. And I think one thing that my very piecemeal career has taught me is that you have infinite capacity to continue to evolve just because you think you want to be a lawyer or a doctor and and you you succeed and then you go now what that doesn't mean you're cemented into that particular career or that particular vocation for life you can change you can augment you can be so many other things other than Mm -hmm. and what you decide uh as, as you are today, you know, tomorrow you can be a new person. And I think that's a really wonderful, resilient thing to remember about humanity. Yeah, and I think um, I, I'm so so thankful that you actually mentioned that because, you know, we are in a, in a time when a lot of students are, you know, excuse the French, but they're shitting themselves. They're like, you know, mm-hmm. what's happening? I mean, I can't even go to school to finish, particularly in Melbourne, um, you know, I can't even get back into school in order to, you know, actually talk one-on-one with my teacher and, you know, what what was it? What do you think that it is about you that actually decides, you know, okay, let's let's move, let's go in another direction? You know, how, how, can, how, can, how can students, like, identify that? Because it's so important to know that. Yeah, honestly, I don't know <laughs> is the answer. I feel like um, a big part of my life has been, just saying yes to opportunities, not knowing how they will end up because you never know how a choice will end up manifesting itself. But if something excites you, if there's a gut feeling that says, yes, I want to do this or I want to try this out, then go and do it. And what is the worst that can happen? You know, the worst that can happen is you go, I don't really like that. I don't think that that's for me. And you move on. And I think failure is the one of the best lessons that you can learn because I don't really Really see it as, as failure so much as you know life telling you maybe this particular thing isn't for you or maybe it makes you even more uh, committed to wanting to uh, to dominate that thing that is stopping you from uh, achieving what you want so I think hard feelings negative feelings as well as positive feelings they can help you navigate and create a structure um, that you can sort of move around so I was talking to a chef friend of mine just uh, just before this call actually um, I was interviewing him for a story and he is just this most amazing inspiration very articulate guy and we were talking about how the pandemic has affected hospitality and it's 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 heartbreaking it's a really terrible time for hospitality and many other industries obviously as well but we were talking about the idea of um, a couple of years ago I saw my friend speak she's an artist and the panel was about um, creative limitations so whether or not it's time it's the brief it's budget um, you will always come up against 
a challenge. And rather than seeing it as a barrier and a negative thing, it's um, if you can see it as a way to build your work around it, and in that particular capacity, we were talking about creativity. Um, but in, in Nick's case, we were talking about it being, well, okay, hospitality is the way it is. How do how does he as a business owner uh, augment and pivot his business in order to deal with what he can't change, which is this pandemic situation? And I think that that's yeah. a very similar sort of lesson that a lot of high school leavers can take on right now is we can't change what is going on in the world. It is regrettable, honestly, to you guys. I feel really feel for you that you are not having the end of high school experience that you expected and you'd hoped and you'd dreamed about for years. Um, and that's that's a sad thing. And I know that you will still, you know, you, you guys will still find a way to connect with each other, regardless of the fact that you can't be physically around each other right now. But this is still a moment in time. These, these are your cards currently. And I would invite you to, um, I guess, to be brave and to think about what can you do? What mm. is this time in the world giving you that other people would not have normally? Yeah. No, that's amazing advice because I mean you think of all of the you know most of the students um that are watching you know their first job is potentially or you know is is in the industry that you're talking about so it's in the sort of you know the services industry and um uh, and hospitality and you know you're right it is a year that you know none of us really expected but you know that's just fantastic advice and it leads perfectly into the next question that we really would love to you know get your sort of take on is in regards to skills because mm. you know um and you're the perfect example you've done so many different things there's so <laughs> many things that you've you know and and it's just amazing because it's just like I can only imagine just stepping into your career it'd just be such a fulfilling you know, amazing thing. But I mean you know that we we really sort of focus on this whole sort of transferable skills um um, I guess you could say section because when it comes to um, applying a skill um, for an industry, um, you know, we actually find that sometimes, you know, you realise that your skill that you actually thought that you had can actually transfer against a couple of different industries and that's something that we'd really love to focus on um, because we believe that it's, you know, one of the things that students need to do in order to succeed in this thing that we call like the future of work. So um, what do yeah. you think um, some skills are that students should acquire or, or realise that they're really great at if they want to get into any one of the things that you've done and and then what do you think your best skill is I'd love to know what you think your best skill is okay well firstly I will be really clear and really honest with all of you guys listening out there make no bones about it I did not know what I was doing at any stage <laughs> in the game I did not I still don't know what I'm doing and that's half the beauty of being human is learning yep. so I, you know, when I finished university and I thought, well, now what? And I was looking at internships. I had also been working, um, you know, at, uh, as a makeup artist on the side at, at Clinique and Mac and things like that. And I was like, well, what do I do now? And I was being offered more money um, doing hair and makeup on music videos and, um, and doing ads and things like that than I ever would have earned as, uh, as a first year intern or something like that. So I just sort of said yes to those opportunities. And, and I thought after that, I've, after a couple of years, and then I'm like, I have all of these makeup skills and an economics degree. Uh, what do I do now? You know, and, um, and, I was speaking to a friend. She worked as a copywriter at Singleton Ogilvy. She said, you know what, you're a really great project manager. Like, you know how to manage people. You know how to do all of these other things. Um, you have that systematic sort of uh, experience from uh, understanding process through, uh, through doing your degree. Why don't you come and learn how to be a producer? And so mm -hmm. I went and studied, um, well, not studied, I, I went and became a producer at Singleton Ogilvy Interactive. And from there, I learned even more project management skills. And I also um, found out that I could write and I could communicate. And then I was started um, to be offered copywriting work as well as production work. So, you know, I think for me, the biggest skill that you can learn is just to go with your gut and say yes to opportunities to learn. Learning is never a negative. Learning anything is never a negative. And there are so many skills that I've picked up along the way and all of the different things that I've done, and they made no sense at the time. 
But now in my current job, I think about what I draw on in order to be me and to be successful in this job. Um, and I'm referring to sort of the, the food judging, presenting sort of side of my career at the moment. And I use every single skill that I have picked up along the way. So even uh, in the depth of things that things might not make sense as to why you want to learn how to speak Arabic or how to um, macrame something or, you know, whatever it happens to be. But somehow I really believe a lot of those skills can actually magnetise and come together and um, they are tantamount to you being flexible, creative, adaptable, multifaceted, and all of those things stand you in good stead regardless of what career you end up choosing. Amazing. Wow. I mean, I mean, I would love to keep on going with some questions that we um, that we sent through to you, Mel, but there is a Q&A box that is lit up like Christmas. Ooh. So I think, I think let's just dive into some of these student <laughs> questions because they're unreal. Um, sure. The first one that I, um, and, and I mean, before we, before we can, we go on, um, I, I, and I'm hoping that you're coming through with the goods here, but show me the ring bling because one of the things oh, that I'm obsessed with. No. Oh, no. Today, just, I only have, this is a, a pinky ring uh, that has a little diamond in it that when my, um, I don't, anyone who owns a pet, you always have one pet that's like the love of your life. And when he died a couple of years ago um, on, uh, in a farming accident, really tragically, uh, my mother bought me a necklace with a diamond in it and it was sort of very tight and very high and so I ended up popping out the diamond and putting it into this ring and so I wear that every single day and that's, you know, his little little soul with me um, all the time, which I really like and it's really nice and heavy so it's kind of something to um, something reassuring to have. And then I just sort of have my wedding bands on today. So I'm not um, not too many of, not too much bling today. We're in ISO. So I'm sort yeah. of paring it down a little bit. No, fair enough. The amount of screenshots that I've actually taken of you when you're on MasterChef, like quickly, <laughs> like, but like all of the rings and jewellery, I'm a massive jewellery oh. fan. But, so anyway, completely digress. Let's get into these questions now. <laughs> so so um, am I. I love, I love a good accessory. You know that about me, oh. Cora. <laughs> Um, so our first question is coming through from Anonymous, but it's a greatie. It's a good one. It's what challenges, if any, did you find being the first female judge on MasterChef? Um, I look, I, I, I'm asked a lot of questions about, you know, the first female judge, first, um, you know, judge of, of Asian background in this particular position. And to be really honest with you, when I was asked to do the job, my first priority was thinking about whether I could do the job I didn't I wasn't thinking about you know what genitalia I have or um, what cultural background I have it, it was more about um, whether or not I could do the job now that the first season has gone to air and I've seen how it's resonated with people it does make me extremely proud to be in a position that no one else has been in in that particular role um, on, on, on a much loved show that is aired globally. And I guess what is most resonant with me is, is what it means in terms of giving people, you know, inspiration and the idea that they can be the first. There are still, a, there are a billion firsts that can happen mm -hmm. in the world. So why not you? You know, yeah. honestly, I remember thinking about, you know, different jobs at different times in my life and thinking, well, why not me? You know, just because I haven't seen someone like me do it before doesn't mean that it can't be done. So right. just go and do it. Yeah. And I guess you're right, you know, um, you know, heading into the role um, within MasterChef, you know, you're probably just thinking more along the lines of, you know, I'm the best person for this job, so let me just get this job done. Um, yeah. But you probably, I'm not too sure if you're aware of, you know, you were a first. So being a first, you know, you actually have um, given so many people, um, you know, hope and it, it potentially, especially girls, you've given them so much more to sort of strive for because they're seeing more representations in the media. And I think that's Thank so you. important. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think Poe po and I were having a conversation about it kind of early on and she said to me, you know, I'm really good friends with the former judges and I wasn't ready 
to have you be in this role. And I said, and she said, but the second you walked into the room and the way you are with people, I realised the value of the power of femininity and the value Mm. of what women bring to every room they walk into. And that's coming from a woman, you know, that's coming from another strong, inspirational woman who others, you know, really have been inspired by as well. I'm inspired by Poe. I think she's incredible. And for her to be that vulnerable and that honest um, in her, um, I guess, initial judgment of uh, the change that, that had come, you know, within her sort of experience within the show, um, I thought that was really inspiring and, and that's something that's really stuck with me is that women bring things to the table and to every room we walk into that men couldn't possibly and mm. we should never forget that. Yeah, wow. Oh, that's just, that's like, <laughs> that's, that's like the cord now. <laughs> it's just like, it's it's so true. Um, and um, thank you for going there. And I think too, you did add a level of kind of great, not, not even grace. It was like this powerful kind of, like, I am here. It was the most incredible <laughs> season. I'm not even going to it because I'm obsessed with MasterChef. Oh, um, can I tell you that walk Walk on the on the first episode, walking into the room and having Gordon Ramsay basically introduce me to the world um, was the longest walk of my life. But I kind of figured, you know, if I'm going to walk in the door, how am I going to do that? And so I pushed open those doors and I just gave it my best, my best strut. And I thought, no, I'm here and this is mine and I'm going to claim this space. And I think women, um, you know, there are lots of discussions about sort of the way that um, we sometimes apologise, not all the time, we sometimes sort of apologise for the space that we take up and we should never apologise for that. So I feel like if that gives any uh, girl or woman out there, um, you know, the permission to really own who they are and really take up the space and voice their opinion and be more assertive then that's that's a win I could stop right there with this with this job and that would be enough I think that would be really cool so um it's very it's a really nice thing to hear so thank you no you're welcome um another question that's come through um that's had a couple of ticks actually next to it so um you seem to have skills in many areas how do you bring that together into meaningful work, um, especially trying to be yourself online? Yeah, I think that, um, look, there's, there's, it's a double-edged sword. You know, if you have many skills, there is that sort of adage of, you know, uh, a jack of all trades and a master of none. And I, um, there is some truth to it on one level and, um, and a fallacy, you know, on, on the other hand as well. I feel like being multi-skilled is really important. If you think about what's going on in the world right now, this is something that we never saw coming. Uh, we can't control the way that it's affected everyone. And so to be multifaceted means that you can draw on skills across, you know, many, many different things. And that may give you uh, a little bit of extra kind of resilience in order to get through tough times. And so each thing that I've learned, I've made sure that I have uh, spent enough time focusing on it in order to be competent. You know, no, I may not be a master at it, uh, but at the same time, I have spent enough hours. It's that whole Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours thing. Uh, I've committed enough time to really having a solid grounding in it to the point where my peers within that particular area um, deem me accepted as, as, part, of, as part of that. So uh, I feel like in sort of generations um, past me now, there's been sort of a a trend towards, okay, well, social media is really immediate. That means I'm really successful. I've done this for five minutes. Now give me all the cash or give me all the accolades. And I think that there's, you know, you need to put in the work. Um, And that was something that I I sort of said, you know, quite early on. And there was an infamous uh, sort of uh, eight-year-old tweet about, you know, me apparently throwing shade on MasterChef and, um, the, the quote was, if you want to be a chef, don't go on MasterChef. And everyone was like, ooh, that's, that's bitchy. I'm like, that's not what I meant at all. What I meant was if you want to be a chef and you truly want to be a chef, not a TV personality or, a, you know, a TV cook or something like that, go and get an apprenticeship 
put in the 100 hours a week for many years and do the work. And it doesn't matter what job it is. If you do the work, you put in the hours, you commit and you feel like some, you've achieved some sense of mastery over it, that's what you're aiming for and that's what I aim for in every single skill that I've learned. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's fabulous. I mean, um, you know, it, it just brings it back to the whole point of just showing up, you know, like, you know, it's fair enough to say that you want to be a chef, but actually you're right. Just let, let's just get down to it and do it. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it leads us into um, one of the next questions actually that's come through. Um, and I'd love to get your take on this actually. It's by, um, so the question is from Maggie and she has asked, um, how has being an East Asian media personality in Australia affected your career opportunities and experience within the industry? Um, well, it's funny sort of this, this tag of, you know, being a personality. I'm, I'm just me as a freelancer of over a decade trying to stay employed. <laughs> That's the way that I look at it. You know, I, I say yes to opportunities. I do the work. I am inspired by the people that I get to work with. And, um, yes, of course my culture comes into it because I – um, a sum of my family history, as well as my um, my experience of being Australian and growing up in this country. And there are perspectives that I will have that other people won't have. And that's the beauty of diversity. And that's the beauty and the importance of inclusivity in every room that makes a decision. I think it's really important to have people of all abilities, cultures, choices, because what that ends up helping to make is a much more robust way forward I think mm. and so for me there have been times where uh, creative choices have been made and um, you know I, I will say well you know what that means or what what, what that signifies in in Singaporean culture or in Asian culture is you know is bad fortune or whatever it happens to be or um, it can be construed that if you if you speak in other isms then you alienate people. And sometimes, you know, when you're in a homogenous group of people, it isn't out of malice that people otherize. It, it's yeah. just that you need to have inclusivity in order for people to really remember that and to embrace it and make it part of their practice. I think it's, it's, a, it's a muscle you need, to, you need to practice and you need to exercise every single day to consider others. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, wow, Mel. Um, we um, oh, yeah. we're, we're, we're kind of just like wow, like you know, just no words to come out of my mouth. But we um, we oh, are kind of nearly. Sorry, but there are some more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, another five hours because we can just take this. No. Um, <laughs> but there is a there is a question in the chat box that I'd love to um just to ask you before we finish with our last question. Um, oh, and yeah. it, it, it does apply to journalism, you know, as a career choice. So um, how did you get into journalism and any tips and tricks into breaking into the industry? Um, the answer is like everything in my career accidentally. So I uh, started uh, off in journalism um, sort of through a back entry from advertising. So I was working in advertising, um, I guess, this is showing my age now, um, at the, I guess, the dawn of social media. So, um, you know, MySpace was going on and Twitter had, had just launched um, and no one was using it in Australia. And working at uh, Singleton Ogilvy Interactive, we were asked to start social media accounts. I know that's very different now. They're asking you not to be on them. Um, but uh, we were asked to have a voice on each of those platforms and to choose um, a subject that we felt reasonably passionate about in order to engage with those communities and, and then go back to our clients. And I was working for clients like Coca-Cola and Nokia and LG um, to be able to say, well, this is how you converse um, with your customers in on, on those platforms. And so I chose food because my parents are Singaporean. Food is part of the DNA. It's part of our love language, the way that we sort of communicate with each other. And so I thought, well, I know enough about food that I could kind of integrate myself into the community. And um, as it turns out, you know, a friend of a friend was an editor for, uh, for some street press in, in New South Wales. And they said, hey, you're writing about food and, um, you know, you obviously are passionate about it, you know, you know a bit about it, would you like to start writing a column for us? 
And I said yes. And looking back on that, um, what a, yeah, it's amazing. You just have to keep going. You just have to start. You know, it was, it was horrific. You know, it was absolutely horrific. But from there, I, you know, I continued to write. I had a blog for a couple of years. And then when Time Out Sydney started, I thought, well, I loved Time Out. I, t- I loved Time Out when I was in London because it was such a guide for, um, okay, if you've just dropped into the country, which I had, where do you go? What do you do? And um, what are the fun things? And so I thought, well, I love this publication, so I would love to write for them. And I, I wrote to the editor and I said, I, I've been writing for the street press. I have a blog. At that time, blogs were cool. And, um, and I said, could I write for you? And she said, sure, here's... Um, you know, here's an assignment. She'd read a couple of pieces of my work and she gave me an assignment and I drove all the way out to Parramatta from where I lived, which was reasonably far at that time. And I was so nervous that I forgot to get the receipt and I drove all the way back to where I lived and um, I was, I did not want to fail at this. So I called the restaurant and I drove all the way back out there to get the receipt. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh my god um, you know it was you know you just I wanted to do things properly and I was really lucky I had an editor who um is not only smart but was also really generous with what she knew and she was a great editor not just a great writer and she is a great writer but a great editor and so she was able to teach me um what to do and what not to do and as I said yes to more opportunities to write for different publications, and it really is a networking thing. So you get to know one editor. The best way to be referred is to do good work. So work really hard. Listen to what you're being told. Deliver on expectations. Um, meet your deadlines before they're due. Offer ideas. You know, and if you get knocked back, be resilient about rejection. Rejection is not about Uh, you it's about whether or not the idea is commercially relevant to the publication um, whether or not it's too similar to something else that's come out so learn how to deal with rejection listen to the people that are teaching you and ask a lot of questions but also just again it comes back to competence that's a huge theme for me is do the job do it well and people will speak of you. There was a really lovely um, quote that I read recently, which is, people are speaking of you in rooms you haven't even walked into yet, yeah, which is quite yeah. emotional and quite enigmatic, but it's true. You know, you are being spoken about in places that you have no idea about just yet. And the way you uh, that happens is by doing good work and by being a good person and by being able to, to show that you are someone worth working with. Yeah, wow. Wow, I think, you know, uh, Mel, I, I don't even think that we can continue on. I think that was the perfect way to end this. <laughs> um, because, you know, it, it's just, wow, just, just just the information that you've been able to share with us and taking us, you know, a couple of steps behind into the industries and the multiple industries, but also just being able to sort of give, you know, your own personal opinion um, is so awesome to hear and, I truly cannot even thank you enough for joining us today. Um, Honestly, I could just jump through this camera and give you a massive (laughs) big hug because, uh, you know, and I know that um, um, the rest of the the people that are watching this as well um, really, really are resonating with so much stuff that you're doing and um, we cannot thank you enough for standing up and just being you within this industry. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I, Kura, I always say to you, you know, offline, I wish I'd had a resource like this when I was in high school because I never knew what I wanted to to really do as we as we have quite adequately covered. And to know that to know that that doesn't really matter, and you're really just building yourself, your character, who you are as a human being, and that will help you dictate you know, where you want to go and what you want to do, I, you know, to, you got, you are giving, um, you're giving people courage out there to, to be brave and, and to not worry about sticking to a script. You know, there is life outside of the, of the lines. And so to be able to, to draw your own path is pretty exciting and it's absolutely possible too. Oh, Mel, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lucky there's a lot of light in this room because I'm blushing at the moment, but thank you. (laughs) 
enjoy the rest of your afternoon and thank you for being on thank career you. con so pumped to have you here so thank you my pleasure thank you so much for asking me oh you're welcome thank yeah. you bye, bye.